Welcome to section 6.3 and 6.4. All right, gentle people, what I want to talk about first is what is covered in section 6.4. Now, you guys are welcome to read it, but I want to distill it down for you guys. There is one major take home message, and that is in section 6.4, they discuss activity. Now, again, you guys can read it, but here's the take home message. When you deal with KC, you are entering in the concentration of the products and reactants. You want to make sure you enter these values in as molarity. However, KC is unitless. What that means is it doesn't matter if you take the molarity and square it and divide it by the molarity cubed. I don't care. KC is just going to be a number. So what you're going to do is plug in those concentrations, crank out a number, and disregard any units on that. So just give me the number. The same thing is true for KP. For KP, what I want you guys to do is plug in all the partial pressures in ATMs. However, KP, like KC, is unitless. So disregard all the units after you crank in the number and make sure everything is an ATM. That's all you need to know from 6.4. Now let's go ahead and talk about the relationship between KC and KP. Before we go ahead and do this, we have to explore how concentration and the partial pressure of a gas are related to each other. So let's go ahead and start at PV equals NRT, the gas law. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take the volume and I'm going to divide both sides by volume. So I'm bringing volume to the other side. If I go ahead and do that, I'm going to have moles over volume. Well, the moles of something over the volume of something is the molarity or in other words, it's the concentration. So what I can do is I can write the ideal gas law as the partial pressure of something equals the concentration of that something times RT. So if I have the partial pressure of A, I should look at the concentration of A times it by RT, and that's how these two things are related to each other. So let's go ahead and see where this gets us. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, what I want you guys to realize is that in Chem 1B, there's going to be a lot of derivations. And sometimes these derivations are going to take pages in your book to explain. I'm going to spend some time deriving things for you, but what I want you to understand is that I'm not testing you on the derivation. I want you to see the thought process from getting from A to B, and most importantly, what is the take home message from that derivation? What are you supposed to plug in to that final equation? So let's start out with a generic equilibrium. I have reactants A and B, and they're going to go to products C and D. So I'm going to start out with my KP expression. My KP expression is going to be the partial pressure of C raised to C times the partial pressure of D raised to the D's power divided by the partial pressure of A raised to the eighth power, the partial pressure of B raised to the Bth power. So just again, the equilibrium expression products over reactants raised to their stoichiometric coefficients. Now on the last slide, what we said was that pressure equals the concentration times RT. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna substitute this equation in for my partial pressures. So what I'm gonna say is that I'm gonna have the concentration of C times RT raised to the Cth power. And I'm gonna do the same for our other products. Then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do all my reactants just like this. So the concentration of A times RT raised to the eighth power. And we can do the same for B. Now what I can see is that there's an RT term in each one of these. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull out an RT. Now what you should note is that this RT right here is raised to the Cth power. This RT is raised to the D. This RT is raised to the A. 
and this RT is raised to the bth power. So I gotta use a mathematical equivalency to pull that out. So what I got left over is C raised to C, D raised to the dth power, A raised to the eighth power, B raised to the bth power. And then I get times RT. Now I have to account for all those exponents. So the equivalency that I'm going to talk about here is this is going to be C plus D minus A plus B. So let's go ahead and try to simplify this a little bit. Well, what you guys will notice is this right here, the products over the reactants raise to the stoichiometric coefficient in terms of concentration. Well, that is KC. And I'm going to go ahead and times this by RT. And what I'm doing is I'm adding up all the products coefficients and I'm subtracting all the reactants coefficients. To write that expression, I'm going to say that is going to be delta N or the change in the number of moles. And so this is one of the themes that I want to go ahead and talk to you guys about. In all of Chem 1B, what you guys are going to see is this symbol right here, the delta symbol. Now, the delta symbol really means take the final thing and subtract it from the initial thing. And so in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the moles of gaseous product. So that means I'm going to look at my chemical equation and look at the stoichiometric coefficients and add that on the product side because that's my final state. And then I'm going to go ahead and subtract it from all the stuff on the reactant side. So I'm going to sum up all the coefficients on the reactant side because that's going to be my initial state and I'm going to subtract it. Now this is going to be a theme, products minus reactants, products over reactants. You're going to see this all throughout Chem 1B. Now what you guys should have seen is in my last derivation, I derived this expression for you. Now this expression is going to appear on your information sheet when you guys take a test. And so what this does is it says that if you have KC, you can go ahead and calculate KP and vice versa. What you'll notice is they're related by RT delta N. So R is our gas constant. And remember, this is the gas constant we used in the ideal gas law. So this is the 0.08206 liter ATMs per mole per Kelvin. And you'll note I said Kelvin. So be careful when you plug in temperature, make sure you put it in Kelvin. And delta N is explained for you guys right here. It's the moles of gaseous products minus the moles of gaseous reactants. Or in other words, sum up the coefficients on the product side, subtract the coefficients on the reactant side, just look at gases, nothing else. All right, gentle people, here is our first quiz. In a moment, the player is gonna stop and it's going to prompt you to answer this. So take a look at this equilibrium. And if I tell you the KP is really, really low, much, much, much less than one at equilibrium, what can you tell me about the partial pressures of ammonia, hydrogen, and nitrogen? All right, gentle people, so here's the answer. So let's go ahead and think about how this works. Now in Chem 1B, what you guys will see is there's gonna be a lot of what if questions. And a good way to answer some of these what if questions is to go ahead and use dummy numbers. Now I suggest that you guys don't use fractions. It's a good idea just to use whole numbers. Try to avoid using one. So let's go ahead and think about this. So let's go ahead and pick some dummy numbers. Let's say that I'm gonna say I have a ton of ammonia. Let's say I have 100, and let's say for hydrogen I have two, and let's pick the same thing for nitrogen, and let's say that's two. So in this case, what I'm saying is that when I establish equilibrium, I have a lot of ammonia, it's at 100. If I were to go ahead and plug this expression in, 100 squared over two, times two raised to the third, what you guys will get is a big number. 
And so this is not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a KP that is much, much less than one. So that must mean that I have to do the opposite. So what I really want is I want a hundred of the nitrogen, a hundred of the hydrogen, and maybe two of the ammonia. If I do that, then I'd get two squared over a hundred times a hundred raised to a third, and this indeed would be a very small number. So what I can say is the amount of nitrogen and the amount of hydrogen must be greater than the amount of ammonia at equilibrium. And so this is one valuable tool that the equilibrium constant tells us. It tells us how favored one side of the reaction is. So if I have an equilibrium of reactants going to my products, and what I can say is my K expression is products over reactants, well, that K tells me after I establish equilibrium, what is the ratio of reactants to products? So if K is much, much greater than one, what that means is that I have a ton of products, so my numerator is really big, and my denominator is really small, or I have a small amount of reactants. And the opposite is true for a K much less than one, which we saw in the last slide. And that's when we look at products and reactants, where I have a large amount of reactants, and I have a small amount of products. And so this is going to tell you how far your reaction is going to proceed. So if you're an industrial chemist working at a chemical plant, you can look at K expressions and you can see when you buy all your chemicals, how much you're going to get out of it. You're going to see if you're going to make a lot of products or you're just going to make a little bit of products and then you can go from there. I hope that made sense, Chem1B, and remember to stay safe.